So on the workbench here, I have a beautifully designed and made American five inch national twist drill wheel cutter. This is what you would use on a horizontal mill. And this one has damage on all of the teeth, just mostly around the perimeter, but it's to a point to where it can't be used and you would never throw away a cutter like this. This thing has never been sharpened before, so it's got plenty of life left. All we gotta do is fix those edges. So I'm gonna bring you in, show you the damage on this, then we'll go over to the cutter grinder and I will show you quickly the setup of what it takes to bring one of these back around, save its life, because their life is worth saving if it was alive. Something like this is not cheap, so let's fix it make ourselves happy, and this cutter, if it could be. So there's a look at the teeth on this cutter. You can see the really chewed up on this side, and this side's starting to break down. Cutters will always start breaking down at their weakest point first, which makes sense. And at that sharp corner, there's just no, there's just not a lot of material for it to dissipate the heat or a lot of edge support. So the cutter's edges always break down first. That's why uh, ball end mills seem to last so long is because they don't suffer from these uh, weak points like uh, a sharp edged cutter does. So let's get this, let me show you the setup then we'll get some new edges on this thing. So let me show you the setup on the cutter grinder. There's nothing here that's difficult but if there ever was a machine that took a lot of accessories it's a cutter grinder. So two tail stocks both of them share the same center height, which is four inches and one eighth off of the deck. So that's center. Our tooth rest, it is also set up, the top of it is set up on the same center. I've also got the cutting or grinding wheel, the center of it is on the center line as well. Now to get all of this set up, at least the finger, these are fixed. Well, this one is fixed center height. But to get everything else on center height, I use just a very cheap little digital uh, that I bought for this purpose only, height gauge. It's about the right height uh, to work for this machine. I can bring it in, it's got a good reach, and I can check you know, the center on everything. Just get it all set up. Now, because this cutter is gonna be ground between centers, I have to have an arbor. This is a piece of old hydraulic shafting. So I'm going to slide it on there, put it between centers, my tooth rest, and now I can index from one tooth to the next. Let me show you how we get set up to grind the proper angle on these teeth. We first got to clean them up, then we'll grind our angle in. So a cutter grinder is one of those machines that there's just not a ton of information out there on the internet about it. There's a lot less of these machines out there than they are milling machines and lathes and stuff like that. So it can be a little difficult to find information. This is the book that I'm using currently. Nice little instruction manual by K.O. Lee, the maker of this machine. Now this book is recommending for this cutter that I put five to 10 degrees behind the primary cutting edge for steel. If I'm going to be cutting steel, that's what it recommends. If I was going to cut aluminum or brass or non-magnetics, it's suggesting that I put 7 to 12 degrees behind the cutting edge. So this is my cutting edge right here. This is the relief angle behind that cutting edge. We got to put some relief or else the cutter will just rub. So for steel, we want just enough to where it doesn't rub because steel is hard. If we put too much relief behind the cutting edge as it pushes through the material, it'll roll that cutting edge over and the edge won't last. But if we're cutting softer materials, we can get away with far more relief. But we're gonna sharpen this as if it's gonna be cutting steel because that's primarily what I cut. Now the edge on this is not completely cooked. Luckily they stopped when they did. Uh, you know, we don't have to remove a ton of material off this, but it's gonna be a pretty heavy grind to get all of this damage out. So let's get set up in this machine and put our primary cutting edge in this and then we'll determine whether we need to put a secondary in after we're done. I'm sure we probably will, but you get the idea. Oh, can I see it? Can I see that, please? Oh, look what I got. Do you want it? Oh. <laughs> Here. 
So like I mentioned, everything is on center right now, including my grinding wheel. So I'm gonna get our cutter on our arbor and in the machine. And now we're gonna set our grinding wheel because we're using a straight wheel. We need to either raise or lower this work head to determine or to impart the proper angle on our edge. That's what's gonna do it. The radius of that wheel is gonna determine and its position in relationship to the cutter is gonna determine the angle that's ground on this. So let me get set up with a uh, with an indicator on the head and we will adjust this to where it grinds, I don't know, six degrees. Sounds good to me, into this cutting edge. So the reason I'm coloring these cutting edges is because it shows up so much better when I grind. It shows the grinding contact place much better. So that's the reason for the color edge. So something that we need to make sure of is that the finger that is resting on the tooth is on the tooth that's gonna be ground. Because manufacturers will sometimes stagger the teeth, they won't be completely even spaced, you, it can mess you up. I've been there. And the reason they do that is because an evenly spaced tooth cutter is far more likely to get harmonic in the cut, vibrate, than one that has a slight stagger in the teeth. So we make sure that our finger, that our tooth rest, is on the tooth that we're grinding. That way, it's always right where it needs to be. So what I'm doing, other than creating a fire hazard here, is drying my kindling. And I'm not just using any kindling. This is what I like to call hedge apple. That's what my dad calls it. I don't know if that's the technical term for it or not. Probably isn't. We call it hedge apple. It grows big green fruits, about the size of a grapefruit, that are excellent for breaking car windshields when you drive under it in the fall as they are uh, falling from the trees. It's the densest wood that I know in my area. It makes excellent handle hammers. Handle hammers. Hammer handles. It also makes excellent axe handles and fence posts if you can find a piece that is straight enough to make a fence post because this tree kind of grows like a bush. It also has a strange odor. When I put it on the stove like this and dry it, which I do quite often, it makes the entire shop smell exactly identical, not exaggerating, to a bag of buttered popcorn. Yep, that smells like a bag of buttered popcorn, exactly. So it's strange that it does that, but I like to get my kindling good and dry because it makes me not have to struggle so much when I, when I start a fire. So I want to give you a little Cora update, the shop dog. A lot of you guys are familiar with her. Oh, oh, I'll take that. Oh. Hmm. For a long time, we looked for her home. If you're not familiar with her story, she showed up here as a stray a few months ago. We looked for a long time to find her owners, but either somebody dropped her or they didn't look too hard for her, and uh, you know we didn't have any luck with that. We also tried to find her a home through people that we know here locally that uh, you know that we trust, and we didn't have any luck with that because most of the people that we know already have pets. So. Here recently, me and Elizabeth and the kids, we decided that, you know, we're just gonna keep her. She's such a good dog, even though we don't need any more pets. Um, I just can't imagine now not having her. She's, she's, she's a really good little shop dog. But anyway, so we, if we're gonna keep her, we're, we, since we decided to, we had to make sure that she was up to date on all of her health things. So we took her to the vet, we got all of her shots up to date, we got uh, her flea medicine. We also had her either spayed or neutered, I don't know, whichever one they do to female dogs to make them do where they can't have pups. We had that done, and that's only been two days ago. So Cora's, she's on the mend, she's doing really well, but there, that first day she was kind of off herself, kind of kind of loopy. But I am happy to say that Cora is now a permanent fixture here in the shop. Well, she's a house dog, but when I'm out here, she's out here. She is a She's a good girl. Oh, can I play with that? Oh. Ow, that's my finger. <laughs> that's the Cora story. She's doing really well. Ain't you girl? Yeah, she's getting, she getting better. So here's the important bit, and that is how much do we either raise or lower 
this grinding wheel to get the angle that we want to grind on the cutting edge. And in my case, we take the diameter of the wheel, just measure it across it. It's 5.382 inches. And I multiply that by the angle that I want to grind in the end of the cutter, which is six degrees. And then I multiply that by a constant, which is 0 0.0087. And that gives me in thousandths of an inch how much I either need to raise or lower the wheel. So 5.382 multiplied by six, that's the angle that I want, multiplied by 0 0.0087, and that gives me 280 thousandths that I need to raise this grinding wheel to put six degrees on this cutting edge. So up with the grinding head, 280 thousandths. So it's 280. So there we go, we're set up, and we're ready we're ready to grind. So that was a total of about 14 thousandths that I've pulled off of this. And you can see that we're still not cleaned up on the badly damaged side. Still see our red marker cleaned up on the other side, but not on the bad side. So I've got to continue on until this cleans up. So I'm going to pull off another five. There we go. There's our primary edge. We took about, probably about 40 thousandths or 80 thousandths off of the OD. So now let's get set up to just dust a secondary angle on this. So one of the reasons why I love YouTube so much is because I'm a visual learner. For the most part, I'm a visual learner. I don't always comprehend all that well what I read in plain text. I like pictures in my books because it helps me to comprehend what's going on. And I don't always understand if somebody just explains. I like to be told and to see what's happening and then I usually get it. Otherwise I overcomplicate things and I think in pictures for the most part. Maybe I'm strange, I'm not sure. What I'm about to do is show you a photo of what's going on after I explain what's going on so everybody gets it. Now I'm about to put in a secondary angle on this. I just sharpened the cutting edges. This thing will probably cut just fine as is. But if it's going to rub, and I don't want this cutter to rub, I want it to cut. If it's going to rub, it's going to rub at the very back of the cutting edge at the heel. Because I've ground this thing down smaller, I've made that primary edge so wide that 
it's it's likely to to start rubbing, and I don't want that. So to avoid it rubbing altogether, we're doing a secondary. Now it's common practice, as the book says, to put in double whatever we put in for our primaries for our secondary. So I put in six degrees for our main cutting edge here, and if I was to double that, it'd be 12. That's what they would recommend for me to grind in for my secondary angle. I put in 15. For my needs, it's not gonna make any difference, and if anything, it'll keep me from having to touch up that secondaries if I ever have to sharpen this guy again, which I probably won't. But if I did, maybe it would help. So let me show you a photo of what's going on, and then we'll grind it in, and maybe even try this guy out on the horizontal mill, see how it works. So here is a side view of one of our cutting edges, and this is what we started off with. No interference in the path of travel. And here is what we're likely to have now, and that is a much wider cutting edge and interference back here at the very back of the main or primary edge at the heel. So to avoid the potential interference in the path of travel to keep this thing from rubbing, what we're going to do is remove that heel down a little bit, and by doing that, we will narrow the cutting edge as well. So for me, it's a lot easier to see what's going on in this photo than to understand when somebody is just flipping their lips and telling me. So I didn't show the setup on the secondaries here because it is exactly the same setup procedure as the primaries, except I'm, I used a different angle. All right, so I think I'm done grinding. That looks exactly the same as grinding the primary cutting edge. And what I'm doing is varying or regulating the thickness of the primary cutting edge, a little red band that's left there. And I wanted it to be anywhere between a 16th and a 32nd. So we're about at a 16th. Just gonna leave it there, as best as I can tell. So that looks pretty good. You can see the band that we ground and the cutting edge that's left behind. So we are all set up to give this cutter a try. I'm really excited to see how it does. I'm sure it'll do fine, but it's just always interesting to see how something that you ground performs. Now in the vise, I have a piece of, it looks like three, maybe three and a quarter uh, industrial stainless shafting, some sort of non-magnetic. It's stainless is what I believe, but I'm not 100% for sure. Gonna be running five, what, no, 50 RPM on a five inch cutter going to be running, going to be starting off slow as far as our surface feet per, or inches per minute as far as our travel goes, just going to fill it out. Not going to start off wide open as this chart says that you can. That almost never, never works well. You, baby steps. The figures on your industrial uh, speeds and feeds, that's almost always centered around uh, production and environment. So you have to take those figures with a grain of salt, start off really slow, and then work your way up, see what you can get away with with your machine, the cutter geometry, the material, right? There's a lot of variables there, and the charts are just a good place to start. So 
with that said, I think we are ready to give this a try. I'm going to be running cutting oil simply because this machine has it and this is stainless. So let's rock and roll. So like I said, start off really easy. No reason to get carried away and throw this out of the vise and bend my arbor this early. So let's just take it easy. And then we can always ramp it up. So let's just go two inches per minute. See how that does. 50,000 step to cut. Should be light. Cutter sounds good. All right, I'm going to back out of this and go a little bit deeper than that. Another 50 thousandths. I think it'll be all right. Hundred thousand step to cut, uh, two inches a minute. We may be able to step up that feed rate just a little bit. Try to speed that up just a little bit. Maybe three inches a minute. Speed it up a little more. I don't like the way that squeaks. Probably fine. But
So it is given a surprisingly good surface finish. Now keep in mind that was 125 thousandths depth of cut last pass. Let me show you the surface finish that we got. I mean, it's what I would expect. Exactly what I would expect. So here's a little closer look. I'm definitely happy with the way that that thing cut. This is some tough stuff, whatever it is. A little bit of washboard in the bottom. I can't, I can't, well, I, I can just barely feel it. But I wouldn't expect anything less, actually, from a horizontal mill. Getting a zero run out is almost impossible. It can be done, but it's not easy. Side finish in that slot looks, I mean, it looks amazing on both sides. So definitely happy with the way that that cutter did. Get out of here, stink bug. Man, wintertime, the stink bugs, that's what we call them, stink bugs. They're little hard shell bugs that if you smash them, they stink. And I guess that's why they're called stink bugs. Hello, little girl. She likes to attack them. And while I've got your attention, me and Cora want to show you a neat little tool that I just picked up, super cheap. A lot of you guys may be interested in it. I know I was interested enough to buy one. So let's go over to the welding bench and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let's go, girl. Let's show them. How about that? So like most of you guys, I am on a pretty tight budget and I try not to make a habit out of buying cheap tools, but every once in a while, I have a weakness to buy something and try it out. And recently I picked up this which is a micro brazing and welding torch. I think it's actually a clone of the little torch made by Smith. Not 100% for sure on that. I picked this up for $22, believe it or not, off of a website named after a very long and dangerous river in the jungle. I've used it several times, and so far my experience with this individual torch has been excellent. I like this thing, especially for the money. It comes with a manual that appears to be copied after a reputable, from a reputable manufacturer, word for word. Anyway, let's break this thing out of the box and use it to braze on or silver solder on a piece of carbide on this chunk of high speed steel. So for little bitty jobs and breaking out a full size torch is just, it's, it's overkill and it can sometimes make, it can make you overheat your parts and just cause you more trouble than, uh, than you would have if you had something more size appropriate which is why I picked this thing up because sometimes brazing small parts with, like I just mentioned, with a big torch is tough. So let's unbox this thing. It would be nicer if the hoses were a bit longer, but it's not too bad. I'm using oxygen and acetylene. And we will fire it up and braze on this carbide, or not braze, we're gonna silver solder. So all I'm doing is coating this little pocket that I've ground out of this chunk of high-speed steel. I'm coating it with the Harris Stay Seal Black, the Flux, and then I, my brazing alloy is the 50% Harris uh, Silver. So I've coated both the pocket as best I can and the back of the uh, little carbide chunk that I'm going to be attempting to braze on. And I just gotta block this up where it won't fall over and it'll stay good and straight. And then we should be ready for business. Well, it would help if you turned everything on, bud.
a little too much solder, but I guess it's better to have too much than not enough. Oh, goodness. We're close. We're done. So check that out. Not too bad. Not, not my best soldering work. Silver soldering work, that's for sure. A little heavy. Actually, a lot heavy on the solder. But it's attached. It's getting ground way back. It'll just be slightly thicker than this high-speed steel blade when I'm done. So all of that'll go away. The important part is that this piece of carbide is secure to this piece of high-speed steel, and it looks like it wicked in really well. Let me get you a little closer. You can see how it you can see how it got into the back and you know up under the chunk really well. So that is not coming off of there. And now I can take this over to the cutter grinder, which I'm not going to do right this minute, and grind it into the shape that I want, which will just be slightly thicker than this parting blade when I'm done. All right, guys, that's it this week. Me and Cora are going to call it here. Come here, Cora. Cora, come here and tell them bye. All right, we're not going to see them for maybe another week. Hey, tell them. <laughs> it's been super busy around here lately, the family and, and day job and stuff. And I'm struggling to find the time to get enough out here to put together some content for you guys every week. I'm amazed that I get it done. Uh, every time I post a video. So I just want to say thank you to the people who out there who leave awesome comments, who take the time to watch my videos every week. Uh, no matter what, you know, I find, oh gosh, sorry little girl, You're walking under my feet. Whatever I find time to show. You want me to get that from me? I'll take it. <laughs> I just want to say thanks from the bottoms of all of our hearts for the support, either Right, Patreon, PayPal, Amazon wishlist, whatever, through all my projects, past, present, future. You get the idea. So that's it. Thanks for watching. And me and Cora, we'll see you next time, won't we, girl? Yeah, we will. We'll see you next time.